Good evening, good evening everyone. We're going to start, hey, hi Paul, Neil. Okay, we're going to start the show and I'm going to call up our four panelists one by one, give them a little introduction and maybe you'd like to show your appreciation of them joining the show and uh, I'm sure it's going to be an entertaining and instructive uh, 45 minutes. Uh, let's see how it goes. First of all, I'd like to call to the stage a very good friend of mine. Um, she's traveled all this way, all this way. She's come all the way from Holland. A very early start this morning, just for this, just to be here with us for the last few days of the festival. Woman International Master from Luxembourg. Round of applause, please, for Fiona Style Antoni. I got my fox here, Fiona. Keep on. Looking forward to that. <laughs> okay. Um, and next, we've got two guys and two girls on the, as a panelist. Um, the next man, I can see him over there. Um, he's come many, many times to this festival. He's a great friend of all of us. He always gets a huge round of applause when he comes to collect his prize, which is always one of the top one, two, three, or four prizes. From France, Maxime vachet le -Grave. Merci, Maxime. Merci. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. <laughs> hey. Next up on my right, please, uh, another young woman. I think it's only her second time in Gibraltar, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sure she'll correct me if, I, if that's not right. Um, she came last year, I know. And uh, one of the, well, I mean, she's, I think she was, uh, she can tell herself. She's international master, she's women's grandmaster from Indonesia, Irene. Karisma Sukanda. I was going to try and sum up your career there, but I'd, I'll let you, uh, you can talk about it maybe. Yeah? Oh, sure. You've been like Asian women's champion, haven't you, once or twice? Uh, yeah, twice. Twice, okay. And in Gibraltar, your second time? Also, second time. So that's yeah. right, okay, good, second time. And to complete our quartet, or quintet with me, uh, for the start of the show, we may possibly make a change or two as the evening proceeds. Let's see. Um, the last remaining seat is going to be filled by a man who was uh, challenged for the World Chess Championship in 1993. Um, and uh, he's an absolute superstar. He loves Gibraltar. Gibraltar loves him. England's Nigel Short. So, we did this last year Q&A and we actually invited um, people to submit questions in, in a box and also on the night, uh, which we then read some of them out. We're doing it a bit differently this time. Uh, we're going to start the, the show up here and then we'd certainly throw anything open to the audience. We've got the lovely Tanya somewhere. Tanya, can you show us who you are? All right. Hey yeah. everyone. Good evening. Um, a very warm welcome to our panel members and to all of you. Thank you for joining us. Stu is going to open the floor for audience questions. We've got this amazing throw mic here. It's also a lot of fun. If you have a question, just raise your hand. I'm going to throw this across. Good luck catching it. And we'll have your question then. Thank you. So if you, if Tanya's going to throw that at you and you can speak into it like a, mi like a microphone. Okay, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right, and Susie is also going to help. Mo Susie, are you going to help? She's going to help as well. It does work, and um, Sus, if Suze has a question for us too, I'm just going to throw it across. And then you just talk into it. Easy. <laughs> into the black bed. Amazing. And then you throw it back. Amazing. That's a nice one. That's great. Okay, let's start with the subject. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to... Is that me? I don't think it's... Is it me? My jacket. It could be my jacket, yeah. Just very quickly, Fiona, just, just tell us about your trip to Gibraltar today. Just tell us how you got here. So I was working in the uh, Vikanze at the Tata Steel Tournament. Uh, it's been many years that I said I wanted to come back to Jib. I played here in 2011. And this year, it was finally time, so I took a plane from Amsterdam this morning, and here I am. What time did you get up? I uh, got up. I had a pickup at 6.30, <laughs> so <laughs> a very early <laughs> wake-up call. Fantastic. Okay, I actually checked your... 
Wikipedia page uh, just upstairs for before this, and this is really nice. Um, in, actually, Tom is here. Tom Weber, he's here in the audience. He's come with you from Amsterdam. Tom? He might be hiding. Oh, there he, might, he is. Hey, Tom, well done. <laughs> this is on your Wikipedia page. Yeah. It says... Fiona and I am Tom Weber won the Blitz Pairs tournament in Gibraltar 2011. This was the first time the Smashing Pawns, a club that she founded with some friends, was represented in any tournament. Tell us about that. Yeah, so when we played here, um, there was the Pairs Blitz, and I said to Tom, we should play. And he said, no, we're just going to embarrass ourselves. <laughs> Let's not do that. Um, but I managed to convince him, and we surprisingly won our, all our games. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was, it's actually the only time I've ever played uh, this format, alternating moves. I've played a lot of, I think, hand and brain. People have heard about that. It's getting very popular oh, these really days. Yeah. But this format without yeah. consultation was the only time, and uh, it was a great experience, and uh, it's one of my fondest memories. Okay, that was in 2011. Exactly, okay, welcome a back. long time ago. <laughs> okay, I think we should talk about Fide. And I'm looking at the man on my right who I think uh, <laughs> can help us. Nigel. Why is Arkady Dvorkovic the right man to lead FIDE? Well, he is indeed. Um, look, already we've seen a uh, very significant number of, of changes. The, the model for uh, FIDE for decades has been to tax the players, tax organisers, tax the federations. 92% of FIDE income was derived from taxing players. And um, this is um, the uh, exact opposite of, of a model of a successful sporting body. So, um, you know, one of the first things he's done is, uh, well, increase the sponsorship and uh, also cut uh, the fees by 40%. So it's very, very significant. And there's a massive increase in the development fund. There are many, many things that we are doing. Um, I'll just, just mention some other things. We're, we're sticking to our statutes. Um, we had certain people, you know, Malcolm Payne was very happy with that... Uh, he got the sponsorship from Saudi Arabia, but um, as he said to a number of people, myself, Emil Sotovsky, he knew very well the Israelis would not participate um, in that event and they would not be invited. Um, with the new administration, there is absolutely no discussion on issues like this. Mm -hmm. We are not going to hold events in countries where um, uh, players from certain federations are excluded. Right. So, you know, we have good regulations. Uh, we're going to put principle before money. And um, What about your personal role, Nigel? What about you personally in the new well, FIDE? I, I, I see myself uh, actually dealing with many, many issues. So, um, uh, it's a sort of floating role. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I would like to see uh, is um, a better representation from the federations. Um, historically, uh, there have been a number of federations uh, which actually don't have statutes, don't have accounts, and don't even have elections. And uh, I think we have to... Um, improve governance and uh, basically require federations to meet certain minimum standards. Mm -hmm. Maxime, I'd like to ask you as, as, a, as a top professional player, one of the world's best chess players, how you feel about the changes at FIDE so far? Um, well, it's of course an interesting development. Um, there are things that uh, obviously uh, were done um, not very properly because of the lack of time, for instance. Uh, the World Rapid and Beach Championship announced three weeks before. In which, in which you did not play, Maxim. You didn't play this. Yeah, I didn't play. Why not? I mean, Why not? Uh, I had plans already and it was going to be too difficult to change my plans, to get a visa in London and everything. But, um, of course, 
I understand very well that it was not possible to actually uh, handle this better than they did. So, you know, I'm not going to be a judge of that. And uh, I hope, of course, that uh, then everything will be transitioning smoothly. And I think it's, it's sort of on the way. I mean, there are things that are, like, because I can talk only from my point of view, so for instance, for sure. the uh, World Chess Championship cycle. Uh, for instance, the f- uh, Swiss uh, tournament is interesting, but uh, in my opinion, if you're going to hold an event like this, it cannot give just one spot. You're talking about the Grand Swiss 106 yeah. players, I believe? I think it should be like uh, almost all or nothing for this kind of event. And uh, as for the FIDE Grand Prix, I cannot talk too much. I just know it went to a knockout cycle, but uh, we don't have the full details yet. Mm. It's actually an interesting change, so I'm looking forward to, to see what, what it brings. Okay, may I ask Irina now, uh, coming from Indonesia, uh, do you get actively involved in the politics of your federation uh, or, or FIDE things? I won't if I help. I mean... Um, I try not to because it's just a little bit too messy. Um, I, I'd rather really just concentrate on my chairs at the moment. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, but at some point later, maybe when I'm, thr- I'm retiring from chess, maybe I'll try my help to help my federation. In I mean, as way. number one in your country, number one woman player, uh, I'm, well, number one yes. active <laughs> player, in fact, yes. does your federation help you? Do you get support from your federation? Uh, currently, no. No? No, everything was by my own. Right, okay. Yep. So, yeah, I hope... Um, I mean, I think this is just a way in, in many of the federations, actually. They're not... Uh, okay, I, I have no idea about the feeder changes to uh, my federation. I still cannot feel the change up, up until right. now. But maybe what I can say is that I'm very saluting uh, FIDE for their decision for the uh, women's candidate. I think yes. it's a very great move uh, right. you know, to advance mm-hmm. the women in chess as well. So. It's also a substantially increased... Price price price. Price. Yes, it's, it's a very good move. Yeah. So, you know, look, we've only just begun, and um, as Maxime has pointed out, there are some teething uh, difficulties. If we have the same problem next year, you will be right to be annoyed with us. Yeah, <laughs> no, I agree. But, but unfortunately, we inherited a situation, and uh, Essentially, we, we, we had only one sponsor and one sponsor who was um, unfortunately not going to abide by the uh, FIDE statute. So mm. that's, that's why we, we needed to change. Yeah, no, like I said, I understood completely the yeah. situation. Fiona, let me just bring you into the conversation. FIDE, have you ever worked with FIDE or do you have any particular ties with the World Chess Federation? Well, I was at the match uh, in London as the deputy press officer. Right, so, so tell us about that a little bit. It was a good experience. Whether I will be more involved or not in the future, we will see. But uh, I think, like most people, I'm very excited about the new management and to see what it's going to bring. But I'm, I was very happy to see Arkady Dvorkovic be elected. Right. Now, this is a question for all of you, but maybe I'll start with Nigel. Nigel, is there a place for Gibraltar in the FIDE family? Um, well, we have our, uh, well, it depends what you mean. We have our statutes, if you're talking about uh, federations, and um, according to our statutes, you need IOC recognition, which Gibraltar does not have. However, I do believe there is a place for Gibraltar with uh, some sort of uh, associate membership, um, i.e. non-voting rights. So that is something which I would like to see. Um, so obviously this is a... Um, <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, um, it's obviously, you know, it's a small territory, but with a very, very active and professional organization. Because we have very just, large federations who do almost nothing. Uh, correct. And, um, but, you know, we have our regulations, and there is a reason, actually, why we, we attempt to follow 
uh, IOC regulations. For some federations, um, it's, they are totally dependent upon government money, and this um, IOC recognition is uh, extremely important. Uh, so, you know, countries like the Islamic Republic of Iran, where I was a coach once upon a time, that was receiving, when I was there, about $2 million a year wow. uh, from the government. Uh, it's the sort of money that would make uh, the ECF uh, extremely envious. And you will see that Iran uh, has gone places. Uh, there are some, some very, very talented young players. It's great to see uh, Sarah Kadem here, uh, who's been playing fantastically well, um, and two second places in the, the Rapid and, and Blitz. Mm. Um, and of course, by the way, sorry to mention this again, <laughs> had we been playing in Saudi Arabia, she would have been excluded. Right. So, um, uh, you know, we, we are in favor of doing things uh, correctly, we, we have nothing uh, against uh, Saudi Arabia. In fact, we're very happy to uh, cooperate with them. Uh, yeah. Delighted to have King Salman um, sponsoring uh, the event in St. Petersburg. But, um, you know, if we're going to host events, we're going to follow our own rules. And mm -hmm. it's, it's as simple as that. I'd like to ask Maxim about something that came up in an interview with Leveronian. One of the interview that I think uh, he gave with Tanya uh, was about wild cards, that he is against wild cards in the World Championship cycle. Do you have a view on that? Uh, in fact, he benefited from that himself. Yeah, I've uh, always been against but it, but um, uh, yeah, that's one of the first things I, I would have changed. Really? Yeah. 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 Okay. The, the problem with wild cards is you always exclude people. Uh, on merit you know it, it's not without cost if you have people bypassing the system mm -hmm. there are people who are qualified and who don't have financial su support who are left out of things right. and actually it's it's historically it's one of the reasons I mean if you if you if you think about the world championship the world championship uh, was essentially a wild card thing uh, that if you could raise money uh, to play the match, you, you got to, to play a world championship mm -hmm. match. Right. And it meant that there were some very interesting players in chess history who didn't get to play, get to play what, um, right. world championship Correct. matches because they mm. uh, were not able to get the financial mm. backing. So uh, I think this is a, um, another positive thing. We're, we're, we're going on merit. Do we have anything from the floor, Tanya? Any questions from the floor on anything that we've raised at the moment? Any points? Tanya, have you got the microphone? Right. So anyone? Otherwise we'll move along. We've had some interesting discussions. Anybody? Any questions on FIDE? I think any, everyone's happy with the new FIDE. Everyone's happy? <laughs> yeah. And what about women's chess? Fiona, what can you tell us about women's chess? I think women's chess has a long, long way to go still. I think what Gibraltar does, uh, among others, is fantastic, of course, but it's still um, a lot of work, a lot of work to be done. When I look around, there's just so few of us. Um, why? I, why, why do you think that is? Yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> It's a question that's very difficult to answer. Of course, as a woman player, you get asked that quite a lot. Um, but the truth is, I, I don't really... I think it's a mix of so many factors. Um, that, yeah, I think, I think we, mostly we need to, to find a way to, to keep uh, girls and women in chess. I don't think that they are not interested at the core. I think it's just a matter of mostly of you know, keeping them interested. Mm -hmm. Irene, tell us about women's chess in your country. Uh, yeah, women's chess currently is very growing in Indonesia. Um, I think we are overpassed the men's actually in really? terms of the numbers. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. One of, the f one, of the f one of the few federations in the world, I guess. Yes, I'm, I'm very that. happy about it, about it too. And then the last few years, actually, we gained more women grandmasters than 
men grandma, so maybe that's uh, one of the factors too. But the thing is, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to also popularize chess uh, nationally, and maybe that's why I was um, being recognized as the Indonesian Forbes 30 under 33 this year. So I'm pretty happy about it too. Uh, I mean, such recognition would definitely help chess more popular in Indonesia. Does, does this tournament get reported in the um, Indonesian newspapers or in the, in the yeah, media? It's Forbes, Indonesian Forbes. Indonesian Forbes, okay. Yeah. But this, this time, I was asking about this tournament you brought. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, will the newspapers in your country be following your progress? Of course, I mean, not only newspapers, uh, I mean, so all sort of medias, electronic and, um, you know, all sort of medias. And then uh, Indonesia also got like a few Facebook groups which I also follow, and then they've been talking about me playing in this Gibraltar uh, masses, and uh, they are, they've been showing a very great sport, so yeah. How many times, Nigel, have you been to Indonesia? You must have been a few times. Uh, a couple of times, yeah. only. Only, yeah. I, I should say that Irene, uh, she's a, a star. When she came to visit me in, in Athens, I should just point out that everyone on the panel here has visited me at one of my homes, at <laughs> least. <laughs> um, Maxime and Fiona in, in, in London, and Stuart and Irene in, in Greece. So... Um, when she came, she came with an embassy vehicle and a chauffeur waiting outside. Um, I can't remember when that was. It was uh, two or three years ago anyway. Uh, it was in 2013 yeah, or 14. I yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's, uh, she's... Um, a superstar. Uh, she's a real celebrity there. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's a bit exaggerating. No, okay. I'm not. <laughs> you know, I have to say, Indonesia has been the country, I think, where I've encountered most uh, enthusiasm. I went on a holiday. It was completely unrelated to chess. I went to a small town on Sumatra. I was playing on the streets, and there was so much enthusiasm. So many people stopped by. And then I got tagged in this one photo of playing chess, and there were so many Facebook groups, you know, of chess fans. Mm -hmm. And I got like 200 friend requests in one day, just from chess fans, you know, that were so happy that the chess player is coming to Indonesia. And I got so many messages, I hope you like Indonesia. And it was just great to see, you know, the love of the people for the game. And it was the first time I'd encountered it on that level, so that was... Uh, memorable experience. And, uh, I, I can recall in, in 1995 I was on a beach in Bali and uh, the lifeguard there was, a, was an arbiter actually. <laughs> so uh, I did ask him um, whether anyone had ever died on this beach and he said on average about 12 people a year. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, seriously, mm -hmm. it was a massive beach and a very popular beach, but they probably don't advertise uh, these things. Maxim, have you been to Indonesia? Sorry? Indonesia, have you been there? Never been. No. Never been? I've been to Japan and China, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. In you have to invite Maxim Irini to your country. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a totally different experience if you're crossing the southern hemisphere. Have you been to the Southern Hemisphere yet? I'm actually not sure. <laughs> no, I've been to Argentina. Okay. Never mind. Okay. And Nigel and Fiona were there. That's correct. Maxim, what about women's chess? Let's hear something on women's chess from you. You've um, been coming to this tournament yeah. so many years now. Um, yeah, my first time in Gibraltar was 2009. And that was the last time I lost to a woman. <laughs> against Nana Zagnizzi, but uh, oh, yeah. uh, anyway, uh, I mean, women's chess uh, has gone a long way, and there's still a long way to go, because clearly there's only Wifan in the top 100, um, so still, I feel like the level of players improved a lot, and uh, I mean, for instance, thanks to tournaments like Gibraltar mm -hmm. and uh, everything that, that has been happening in the last few years. Um, I think also the, they get better and better coaches, and that, that helps a lot. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, in general, it's more and more professional. So I'm certain that uh, the gap I mean, there's still a tremendous gap of strengths, and I think it will eventually, maybe not even out, but at least 
get closer and closer. Right, right, right. Well, d don't, uh, to, don't sorry, ever sorry. say that men play better chess than women <laughs> on average, because you'll find that uh, you'll get some publicity for <laughs> that. <laughs> Tanya, anything from the floor? Yes. Okay, so we've had two important discussions which I think are very relevant. One on FIDE, one on women chess. Talking about FIDE, just to, just to see how, how people feel about it. Those of you who feel that the new FIDE is a positive change, raise your hands. Interesting. Not, not as much as I would have thought, Nigel. And those of you who believe that they need more time to really prove and we can't really say right now how good it is. Please raise your hands. Why is your short raise his hands? What is this? <laughs> Interesting, still looking good. Uh, my and I'm gonna pass himself. the mic to Mr. Stuart Since Rubin for his question, but before that, on women, on women chess, how many of you believe that we will have a woman world champion? Sorry? No, like, a world champion who's a woman. How many of you believe that that'll happen one day? Brian? <laughs> On the panel? Well, why not? <laughs> yeah. All right, that's interesting. I could have, yeah. Um, yeah. A question from Mr. Stuart Rubin. It wasn't actually a question. You asked about women's chess quite correctly. In my opinion, the reason there are fewer women players than there are male players is because there are fewer women players than there are men players. It's simply a weight of statistics that denies advancement. I'm so pleased that Brian Callahan at this event has taken further forward what um, Leonard Barden and I introduced in the Lloyds Bank Masters. I was introduced in England a great deal earlier than that when Vera Menchik turned up. You know, so that's actually before my time. Of Can course. you believe that? <laughs> of course. <laughs> any other comments from the Thank audience? You. Anyone else that? with yeah. any questions? Yes, Andrew? Yes. Let's try it. It's true. Go on. Yeah. Yeah. Mind your glass there. That's it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Nice one. Andy, go. You have to yeah, talk yeah. into yeah, it. Yeah, talk there. into the mic. <laughs> the other way. <laughs> Interesting. We have a lot of players this year from Argentina, uh, f especially also from Patagonia. One man here from uh, Tierra del Fuego, Nigel, right at the oh, very bottom. Wow. So, um, okay, anything else from the floor at the moment? No? Uh, we have a question from yes. Brian. A statement. Well, it was about the, uh, was it? Yeah, about the last question. I actually feel women are going to take over the world, so why shouldn't there be a woman's world champion? Sure. <laughs> okay. Nigel, you had a difficult game today. You told me after your game that you had you got a rook trapped or something. 
And I did. Uh, I did. We, we just heard the news that Vladimir Kramnik has announced his retirement from classical chess. You may not all of you know that. He announced uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, or anyway, the last day or two, yeah. uh, he's, ret oh, he's retiring today, from classical chess. Nigel, your thoughts? Um, well, he's been talking about this for a very, very long time indeed. I didn't take him seriously in the, you know, in the past, but I, I can understand it now. Um, he's just had a very tough tournament in, in Vikense. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what he said is that the, the motivation goes. And once the motivation goes, you're not interested in working. And once you're not interested in working, you get in a, a downward spiral. So uh, I'm very, very familiar with this phenomenon. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, there are other reasons, you know, I mean, uh, why one may play worse. I mean, it's not as though he's ancient. He could uh, continue. But of the, course. the motivation is actually the key thing. Uh, Dr. John Nunn said um, he thought this was the main factor in people's decline. Yes, the brain rots. Uh, yes, people's energy levels dip. Uh, but the, the, the main issue is that people just... Uh, lose the enthusiasm to, to keep on working. Is it something that you think you could imagine yourself doing also uh, quitting professional chess? Yeah, pl well, as a player? you know, I, the problem is I'm uh, unemployable in any other capacity, so <laughs> I need to <laughs> some sort of uh, uh, income. But um, I, I, I can tell you something which was interesting to me. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to apologize here for, for the many people in this room who don't uh, know anything about cricket. But um, uh, I rem remember seeing an interview of Glenn McGrath, the great Australian uh, fast bowler. Um, and he, um, he said he started some series... Um, very eager to do well in the series and by the end of the series he just knew that he, he wanted to retire and for me uh, I, I haven't quite got there but um, uh, you know I, I played in every Olympiad since 1984 up until last year when of course I was running for FIDE president and for me, actually, the Olympiad was always a, a tremendous joy. Uh, it, was a, it was a source of pride to, to play in the Olympiad. And, uh, you know, then I decided uh, not to play last year. And uh, I absolutely wasn't bothered. Really? You, you, know. didn't, you didn't miss yeah, it? Absolutely not at all. And so it means there is something has shifted mm -hmm. in, in my mind, you know, after uh, so many years um, of playing for the country. And I just thought, you know, if I play, I play, if I don't, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I just didn't care. Yeah. And um, I was doing other things which I thought were much more important. And, um, but you're playing here, Nigel. I'm playing here and I'm glad to be here. And, uh, you know, if I didn't, Blunder rooks quite so often, I might be happier. It, it was the same story like last year. I, I had plus three, and then I play Leveronian, and he sends me on a downward spiral. Um, Just like and, this year. <laughs> and it's the same, the same again this, this mm. year, plus three, and then uh, sort of crashing back to in the direction of 50%. Mm. Maxime, chess, what keeps you playing chess? What drives you forward? What, uh, he's young. He's young. <laughs> yeah, I'm young. I still have s something to play for. And, uh, yeah, but talking about Vladimir a bit. Yes. Um, Were you surprised? Did you, did you know this was going to happen? Um, well, surprised in a way that I didn't think of it. Uh, but he's indeed been talking about it for a long time now. Uh, I think the first time he told me about it was in 2013. 
Okay. So before the World Cup in Tromsø, then he batched me there in the semifinals. So mm. not bad for someone who prepared this retirement. But anyway, um, he's been a wonderful player to watch. Uh, I've had also the pleasure of uh, working with him a bit, so I know fully well uh, his capabilities. Mm -hmm. Also in terms of analysis, which were maybe even more impressive than his playing uh, abilities. Well, and we're talking about a man who, who bet Gary Kasparov in a 16 yeah. games match. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, really uh, adds off to him and best of luck right. to Vladimir yeah. for, for his uh, uh, next steps in life. Okay. Yeah. Fiona, what about tell, tell us a little bit about your chess career. I know you travel to lots of events. You 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 work. Uh, you do a lot of video work, uh, publicizing work. Uh, tell us in your own words. Yeah, so I started in 2014. I think uh, I, unlike Nigel and Kramnik, I suffer like an amateur's curse. Curse where at some point I think I was playing too much. I wasn't putting in any work in. My rating kept dropping, and I had the same. I think problem on a different level, of course, but uh, I was a bit fed up <laughs> yeah, okay. with playing. Did, and, you, did um, you consider quitting? No, <laughs> uh, <laughs> not yet. But I, I was lucky that I got this opportunity to remain in the chess world, but um, actually also, I mean, I'm a 2100 player. I'm never going to make a living from playing chess, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but then this opportunity came up to, to work on tournaments, and it's been a, a fantastic adventure. It's... Um, I'm very lucky to be able to make a living from, from my passion and to travel and to meet all these great people. Right, I, yeah. I think really there's such a big social element to, to the game of chess. It's mm -hmm. not just a fantastic game, a fantastic sport, um, but it's all these people, you know, that you, you see all over the world. Some of, some of them I might see once a year, some I might see more often, but um, it's a great game. And right. And yeah, and I just wanted to say as well about uh, Kremnik. So I was in, in Vaikanze now. Of course, when, yes. Um, and I thought it was a bit uh, sad, actually, to see, to see him commit chess suicide like that yeah. in quite a few games, especially, of course, the last game. Um, but I think what is good is he said he wants to remain in chess. He might play the occasional Rapid and Blitz tournaments. He will play Simmers and... He said he wants to get involved with uh, chess and education, so right. I wouldn't be surprised to see him open maybe his own school or something, and I think it will be good to... He's never played in Gibraltar, Vladimir Kramnik. Does he think it's too late, Nigel? Yeah. Too late? Too late, yeah. <laughs> too late. He did say to me some years ago, he, he said if he could get paid lots of money for doing nothing, he would quit chess immediately. <laughs> yeah, but I think he has sort of a chess school in Russia. At least is uh, in charge of uh, a similar project. In, in Russia. Tanya, any questions from the floor? We do from our Norwegian friend. Yes. Uh, a question for Maxime. Uh, I guess you followed the World Championship match. We're from no, Norway. I really we, didn't. Uh, <laughs> we, just, uh, we just wanted to ask you uh, how did you assess the, the level of the match, the level of play from, from both players? And, uh, and do you ever see yourself qualifying to play a World Championship match? Um, yeah, Coming the from Magnus's very good friend. <laughs> yeah. No, the level of play was uh, extremely impressive. The level of preparation. Uh, with black as well, with white, I think uh, uh, both Fabiano and Magnus had some uh, difficulties setting up problems. And uh, as for me qualifying, if I thought I didn't have a chance, I might follow Vladimir's footstep <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. Was that, does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> All right, any more yes. Matthew? Just tell us your name and your question. Hi, my name is Matthew Wilson. Um, so Alpha Zero is not commercially available because it's not part of DeepMind's mission. Um, but at some point, top chess players are going to get a hold of extremely sophisticated AI, sophisticated neural networks. Do you think this will dramatically change the game of chess, kill the game of chess off, um, if these kind of systems prove the game's a draw? Um, or generally, what, what, what difference do you think it'll make? And do you think there'll be some sort of arms race as top players try to produce their own systems and, and get ahead of the opposition? Mm. Maxim? Um, well, first of all, I think uh, 
we can all say, safely imply that chess is a draw, so even if we get a formal proof of it, it will not change much on the mm. current situation. Um, in terms of um, preparation as assisted by AI, um, I don't think it will dramatically change because in a way, I mean, that might be um, a bit optimistic, but uh, the combination computer and human, you know, who can uh, go through the moves and then make a step back if it goes wrong and keep on analyzing like this, it's, I don't think there will be a really huge difference uh, uh, compared to an AI, but I might be wrong. And uh, uh, if anything, it might enrich our knowledge of chess. Um, but of course, uh, ever since computers got so powerful, uh, the level of preparation has dramatically in increased from amateur level to uh, grandmaster level to obviously super grandmaster level. And um, th this trend has been drying out a bit the games uh, in uh, most super tournaments, for instance. What about the difference between open events, Maxim? Actually, that brings us on to a subject I would like to ask you all as well. Um, like ours in, in Gibraltar, where you're playing someone 200, 300 points below you maybe, and you really have to win in order not to lose rating points. Um, yeah, of course we have to win. Also, we're playing weaker players. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, we're expecting to, wi to win more often. So, Do you yeah, play other Opens during the year or only Gibraltar? Do you play other Open tournaments? I played in Isle of Man this year. So, yeah, yeah I play one or two open tournaments a year right. generally. Um, but yeah, when you play the likes of Magnus Carlsen, Fabiano Carana, Levan Aronian, uh, Vladimir Kramnik, um, you're not expected to win that many games. And um, of course in an open tournament, uh, I'm gonna win some more. Uh, I'm still gonna make a few draws, especially with black. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's refreshing, I mean, I, I don't like the fact, for instance, I mean, this we haven't discussed, but I don't like the fact that uh, we get to see always the same faces in every event. It's interesting you said that. And uh, that, for instance, I play Magnus and Fabiano and everyone. Right. I don't know, uh, 10 times a year, maybe more if we can't drop it. Do you think that feeling is generally shared between the, the sort of group of, your, of the top guys? Or? I sort of think so, but yeah. I could be wrong. It's mm. incest, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what it is. <laughs> incest. Irene, what about, what's it feel like to come to an Open like this one and be able to play the likes of Maxime and uh, Hikaru and all the other fantastic players who are here? Yeah, of course, I'm very happy. And if, if, um, if it was possible, I would like my games to be all my first round games. So I got, I got to play somebody like Levon, like Maxime, you know. Right. in every game of mine. But yeah, I mean, this is a very good opportunity, especially for the girls as well, to be playing uh, against, you know, 26, 2700s, which I don't think I, we can actually play in any other tournaments, uh, unless it was like something like Isle of Man, or, you know, it's very few in right. a year. So uh, uh, yeah, the Gibraltar is definitely um, going to be my permanent calendar in my tournament schedule. So. And I think for the years to come, there will be more girls playing coming here, and then, uh, yeah. Coming to Gibraltar. Of course, coming to Gibraltar. This is this is definitely Very my good. favorite tournament. We hope so. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually far more interesting to have players of different uh, of different ability. Hmm. So, um, you know, um, I played in the past in a lot of these top events, the sort of uh, events that Maxime um, has described, and uh, except the standards are even higher uh, today, and um, when there is such a high percentage of draws, then it's a problem. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, really a problem for, for chess, yeah. and um, There'll be some changes, I'm pretty sure, to the World Championship final. Um, exactly what they will be, I don't know. I've certainly contributed my, uh, uh, my tuppence worth uh, of thoughts. 
Um, but um, I think the the Carlson Caruana. Twelve draws. Match, just to remind everyone, was, twelve draws. It was draws uh, in inadvertently chess. provoked an ex existential crisis hmm. uh, in in chess, and um, uh, I think in future you can't have so many free days uh, that right. they have to be reduced substantially because we know uh, that chess, if played correctly, is a draw. So, you know, in, in a way you have to induce uh, some, some errors. Yeah, if I may add, because I'm a proponent of reducing the number of free days right. uh, in the match because... Of decreasing. Uh, of decreasing, yes. yeah. So you've been preparing for the match for six months. Right. So you don't need one free day every two games. Right, yeah. yeah. Who in the audience agrees with that? Yeah? Reduce the number of free days in the, in the World Championship. And yeah. this way you can also... Uh, and it's I boring mean, you, as well. If it's you're keeping a match, uh, because Nigel might have said that this was not certain, but uh, if you keep a match, you can also increase the number of games this way. Right. Uh, yeah, I, That's true. I, I, I like... Uh, I'll tell you why I like... Uh, I, I wrote an article in New in Chess. It was my last article, because I got sacked, actually, by <laughs> New in Chess. But... Uh, um, I, um, uh, I said that, um, that the, the problem with tournaments, tournaments are, are very interesting, but there is a, a, an inherent danger in tournaments in that you can have fixing. And the problem is, I mean, the point about playing a match is if your opponent, you know, your opponent can't, lose on purpose against you well he can but he's mm. only helping it you know and and you can have people selling games uh in in a tournament um uh format so this is i think uh i don't think these sort of things happen very often by the way i should s state that uh, i think it's rather infrequent but if you do have such a case uh, it's, it's an absolute disaster. And this was the whole point about, you know, Bobby Fischer in Curacao uh, in 1962. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he said that the commies were cheating. And, uh, it, well, okay, it wasn't a world championship tournament, but it was a candidate's and tournament. And, and he was right. I think he was not even implying they were losing on purpose. I think no, they were drawing, they drawing, were drawing on purpose. They, 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 they were drawing, yeah, yeah. You, know, you know. But it could be the case. It could that, have been, of course, yes, a loss yeah, on purpose. Yeah, yeah. Yes. In fact, the they were just saving their energy like, in a very long tournament, which is, which is, well, it's fixing. It's fixing the results. Of course, and also by the end, it could have been lost on purpose, but like. Not even lost on purpose, but lost as bad by higher authority. Yes, yeah. So I think it's got to, it's got to be matches. At, uh, Fiona, you were at the match in London, the Magnus Fabiano match. Um, was there a real buzz there? Because, I mean, uh, was it like in terms of the public, the audience, the people in London, was there much of a noise about chess or was it a lost opportunity? I think it was a, a big lost opportunity, especially when you get to hold a match in a city like London where there is so much potential. Um, I have to say I was a bit disappointed. Um, it was the first match I attended, so I don't have anything to compare it with. But right. uh, obviously I've been to a lot of other tournaments and I lived in London myself, so I know how much love there is for the game in London. And there, wasn't, there were a couple of posters at the venue and that was it. A lot of people couldn't even get in, you know, and right. if you could get in, sometimes you had to pay up to 70, 80 quid and you were only allowed in the playing hall for 15 minutes. I'm Ridiculous. Like, yeah. Um, I think we're going to have a change in the panel now, um, and uh, because we had uh, Alejandro who had agreed to come on. Maxim, thank you so much for joining the panel. Maxim Bashelograf. <laughs> Alejandro, welcome. Well, thank you. Hello. Your first time in Gibraltar. First time in Gibraltar. How does it feel? How does it feel? Pretty great. Uh, already one of my favorite tournaments. Uh, <laughs> It's really fun, the weather's nice, yeah. uh, side events are great, playing conditions are nice, and it's so strong. I really it's like really that. How's your tournament going so far? So far, so good. I kind of let a big fish go today, but 
Who was that? Uh, Chaparinov. Right. I'm sure I was winning at some point, but I just couldn't finish him off. But I'm pretty happy with my performance so far. Great. Now, I know that you, you're Costa Rican. Mm -hmm. I believe you were the, one of the youngest GMs in the world when you got the title. Is that correct? I think when I got the title, I was in the top five youngest ever right. at that moment. And when I got the title, the only person that was younger than me, I think, was Sergey. Because I think I did it before Magnus. Sergey Kayakin. Kayakin. Yeah. yeah, sure. Mm. And now you live in St. Louis? Yeah, I live in St. Louis, capital of trust in America. Yeah, tell us about that a little bit. It's uh, pretty nice. We've had uh, an immense amount of progress in every area of chess in St. Louis for the last 10 years. Thanks to one man? Pretty much one man, Rex Singfield, that really has sponsored anything you can think of inside the chess world. Of course, uh, from the international perspective, everybody sees our top tournaments, including the US Championship, the Singfield Cup, the Grand Chess Tour. But uh, once you're in St. Louis, you realize there's so much more. Right. There's uh, so much outreach in what's Scholastic Chess. Uh, there's so much outreach in many different chess programs that people uh, can't imagine. Okay. Rex is, a, is, a, is an amateur chess player. He must be. I, I, I don't know him. Is he a... Yeah, he's an amateur, but uh, he still cares. He trains. Uh, he knows one or two openings. <laughs> right. What about the changes, the, 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 the subjects that we've been talking about that you've um, been listening to? FIDE, women's chess, anything you want to say about those subjects? Uh, from your perspective over in the States? I think in those subjects, I'm not the expert. I think the panel covered it pretty well. Yeah? Mm. <laughs> well, one thing I might say, uh, in the last few days, uh, there has been a change in that uh, FIDE has reclaimed the world championship and the candidates. And it was one of the things that Fiona was complaining about quite rightly. Uh, in my view, in London, we inherited the situation. The previous administration favored uh, this deal with Aegon. In fact, Macropolis, uh, who was uh, voted for unanimously by the English Chess Federation, to their <laughs> great shame, um, extended the uh, contract to 2026. We have now changed this we are taking control of the World Championship, and it means that uh, we will get sponsors, uh, we will get bids from places, and I believe Rex Singfield in St. Louis will be one who will be interested, and hopefully we'll get many other bids, uh, particularly from Norway and other places as well. So this is a very, very important change. I think um, the Aegon contract was not in the interests uh, of FIDE, and it certainly wasn't in the interests of chess. It may have been in some individual's interests. Interest. Uh, what is needed for chess to attract sponsors of the likes of Coca-Cola, Google, uh, some huge uh, corporation like that? Or is that not, never going to happen? Uh, well, I think it can happen. I think uh, early stages. Um, in fact, I propose to Demis Hassapis that we, we don't have an ELO uh, rating. We have a Google rating. And, uh, you know, there are all sorts of sponsorship opportunities that Demis was very interested in in the idea, um, you know, he's part of Google, he's mm -hmm. not the top uh, guy, uh, you, know, because, uh, I mean, you know. But right. these are the sort of ideas which uh, I think are very, very obvious ideas and they just have not been tr tried. Right. We've had an organization which is, you know, their only idea is to tax players. You know, if they would have thought of taxing players for uh, fianchettoing their bishops, uh, then they would have done so, but they're not smart enough to think of uh, such a tax. But that's basically how they've, they've operated, a rent-seeking model for decades, which has done absolutely nothing for the game. I mean, we read that people like Sir Richard Branson are keen chess players, but Correct. he's never put a penny into chess, as far as I know. Correct. You know, yeah. And, and yeah. maybe Bill Gates and others, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, let's not forget until, you know, recently we, we had a president of FIDE 
was on the uh, US Treasury Department sanctions list, and sure. that uh, is not very good. And we, we've had immense problems even opening a bank account, and that's actually what, uh, it, it's, it's really sad to say that this is one of our achievements in our first 100 days to open a bank account, and it is incredibly difficult when the reputation of uh, an organization is rock bottom, um, that, uh, you know, banks won't touch you. But uh, thankfully, we've over, uh, uh, you know, we've overcome that and uh, now have a bank account at, uh, how do you pronounce it? Kaiser. Okay, so. mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like the goddess of chess, Kaiser. Oh, yeah. or what, how do you pronounce I it? The yeah. bustle. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Tanya, anything from the audience? Anything from the audience? If not, I have, yes, yes, you have a question. So please tell us your name and state your question. I'm Mark Cobb. And from uh, Kansas, Mark. You're from yes. Kansas, right? You came from, last year. From Kansas, yes. Good to have you back. Uh, with the Karpov Chess School in the United States. And uh, so you were talking about the uh, World Championship and what would you think of increasing the energy element by making them play two games a day for two weeks for 24 games? Wow. Who are you asking? Irene. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Irene, what do you think about it? No, no, no. Let it be for Ali because um, he was the second of Caruana. Okay, so the, the idea, if I got it right, is to play two games a day. I believe so. For two weeks? I think that's right, yeah. But the current world championship is three weeks, right? One game a day. One game a day. Well, I get paid by the day, so I don't really like your idea. <laughs> <laughs> Two games a day is tough, no? What about quicker time controls? Who thinks that the time controls should be made shorter, quicker to get the games, uh, yeah, in yeah, general? So double rounds are an abomination. They are a crime against chess. So they should never happen under any circumstances. Mm. And actually, if I had my way, and I know people will oppose me, I would say you should never even rate any event that you have double rounds. It right. should just be automatically uh, dis disqualified from being rated. That would be my view. And okay, I know, okay. I, I I know have, I have other people view. would have... It's the same reason you don't play two games of football in one day. You don't play two games of tennis. You don't play two games of cricket. Because the quality goes through, through the floor. Alejandro, you yeah. were going to say something? I think chess is a very flexible game. And I think that we should have more types of chess. Uh, more okay. tournaments that are double rounds. More tournaments that are rapid. More tournaments that are blitz. More tournaments that try this and that. I think that... When it comes to the World Championship, it's very clear that we should uh, strive for a high, um, probably as high of a quality of a game as possible. But uh, the idea that you have tournaments even as wonderful as this, but that take 10 days, is really tough. For Not for us, like chess professionals, that you can schedule it in. We know one year in advance that I'm going back to Gibraltar. But uh, for a lot of amateurs, it's very difficult to take this amount of time. And it's difficult for them to ask of many people to dedicate 10 days of their lives uh, to a tournament. Whereas double rounds enable you to do tournaments in three days, four days, uh, sometimes in a weekend. Yes, it's not ideal. Yes, it's not going to be high quality. But I think that sometimes we focus too much on quality of games and how good chess is at a professional level. And it goes back to what you were saying about sponsorship. Or why would somebody sponsor a game that's not played? And double rounds enable so, much, so many more people to play uh, schedules that they wouldn't be able to in a traditional nine round, one rest day, 10 day tournament. You have a lot of double round events in the States, a lot of, a lot of large number of games packed into as few days as possible? Yeah, of course, it has its drawbacks. Uh, they are sometimes popular. For example, things like the World Open. I mean, it's an incredibly strong tournament. Yes, a lot of people see it as an abomination of a tournament because you have two, uh, a bunch of double rounds. Uh, there's no preparation, everybody's always exhausted, you can't barely have time to eat. But it's, it's part of the challenge, it's a different type of tournament, it has its prices, it has its ups and downs. Um, I don't think that just because there is an ideal type of tournament, we should skew having other types of tournaments right. that perhaps are not right. as ideal for us, but more accessible to other people. Fiona, what do you think about that? 
was just thinking about what Alejandro was saying about you know how there is so much room for new types. I'm really excited, I have to say, for what the Norwegians are doing this year. Uh, with uh, knowing permanent time control, and if the game is drawn, they will have a, a playoff, so there's always a winner at the end of the day. And I'm, I have to say I'm very excited for that. I, I think it could be a complete success, could also be a complete fiasco. I think there's a, a lot but of the willingness room there. to try new systems there too. Yeah, to exactly. To I to think there is so much room, yeah. you know. There, um, so I, I'm very excited to see where chess is going to go. You but probably I won't know this. Sorry to interrupt. You won't know this, friend, but we actually had three visitors here from Norway chess during Gibraltar. They came, they stayed a couple of days. Did you know that, Nigel? And uh, I don't know if you knew. That you, met them. you met them, of course. Yeah, yeah. So uh, having a look at what we do here. And we have also visitors coming tomorrow for two days from Sitges, that's pronounced right, the strong tournament up in Catalonia in Spain. So we think that's because we're doing quite well. And people want to come and spend time and see how we do it. Irene, what do you want to say? Please. Mm, I don't know. Uh, I mean, about, um, well, I've played chess. What about double round tournaments yeah, and I mean, that kind of thing? I've played chess all around the world and uh, I would say okay in the US sometimes in the weekend I, I play like three games a day yeah. same goes with in Australia it's very common practice there because everyone right. was busy with either working or schooling so yeah during a weekend sometimes there are like 60 minute game for three games so yeah uh, of course it's more accessible for the amateurs and uh, you know to play more games um, in the shorter time control but definitely for World match, um, I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, one game a day is, is much more uh, proper. Yeah, but this is why you have this is why you have rapid chess. You know, if you want to play more games a day, and it's perfectly fine to do that, you you have a much faster time control. What I'm against is trying to play some sort of classical chess twice or even three times. In, in Australia, they play three times a day, you know, trying to play classical chess three times a day, and everybody's dead has, at has, the end has, of it. Sorry, no, has Magnus not said that he thinks that the World Championship should, the classical World Championship title, or the World Championship title, should include rapid, or possibly include rapid and blitz games? Yeah, did he not say that at the end, of Fiona? Yeah, I, w I have to say, um, I was a bit surprised Surprised in a way because I think there's uh, the World Championship matches have such a rich history and it would be such a fundamental change. So I was a bit surprised, but I think he has, of course, a lot more experience. He has a lot more knowledge about chess history. And um, he's also very I'm, good at blitz. He's also very good at <laughs> rapid and blitz. I mean, I'm personally against it. Uh, I also think matches should keep their classical formats and, as Alejandro said, you know, uh, give the players the chance to play the highest. Uh, possible, uh, possible quality of chess, but um, yeah, I know Magnus is a big fan, and we'll see. Tanya, in the audience, anyone? Yeah, we have a question from Kenny. Hi, Kenny. Hi. I'm, from, from, I'm, uh, tell us where you're from. I'm, I'm Kenny. I'm from South Africa. I know, yeah, but just tell us. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, where I'm from? Uh, I'm from South Africa, and we have lions. And to be, to be the, you know, when the lion comes. You have kingdom. lions. Yeah, we have lions. So yeah. <laughs> to be the, you know, to, to rule the kingdom, you have to dethrone the, the king. So um, I'm of the opinion that um, the classical format should remain classical. And um, the challenger, it's on the owner, the owner is on the challenger to, to prove that he can become the world champion, to dethrone the world champion in classical chess. So, um, yeah, this is basically my opinion. And uh, I would like to know what you think about um, the challenge of proving to be the next world champion by dethroning the world champion in only classical chess and not rapid chess. Um, you think the current system is perfectly fine? No, no, I don't think there should be rapid or tie break blitz you, or rapid. You, I, you, you just, you, 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 you're proposing going back to the old system yeah. that, that, that the challenger should win. The, the challenger the, should, should prove that he yeah. can overcome the, the world champion because. Uh, he wants to be world champion, you know, so to be the man, you have to beat the man. Yeah. So that's, I mean, Kramnik defended this title oh, by, uh, against Peter Liko by drawing the match. So Liko, unfortunately, did not, did not become world champion. There were no tie break. Yeah. So we don't remember Peter Liko becoming world champion. And we still remember Kramnik was world champion. So, yeah, I would like to know your thoughts on, on, on this, on the stake. Anyone? Man, we only drew it, now I have to win. <laughs> I think that 
it, there's a lot of debate about how to break ties in chess, mm -hmm. not just for the World Championship, but we've had this We have tie breaks here, by the way, for the first prize, Alejandro. You maybe don't know it's your first time here. No, right, no, I watch every year. It doesn't matter right, if I'm okay, here yeah. or not. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it, it's tough. I mean, for the World Championship, I don't think you'll ever find a way to make everybody agreeable on it. Uh, of course, Rapid and Blitz is uh, far from ideal, especially when you work for Fabi. And I think that other systems, like giving the uh, player that is defending the champion an inherent advantage over the challenger, it's also a little strange, because at the end of the day, why is the world champion who's already waiting for a challenger to appear after a very long process also given the advantage of a point right. And I've heard different ideas. I've heard give the challenger an extra white. I've heard uh, other kinds of stuff. And I think that we can try different things. I don't think any idea so far has been truly terrible. But at the end of the day, we're always going to have the disagreement that it's not ideal on, on what to do. Mm -hmm. Because uh, draws are part of the game. Tying right. the matches are part of the game. And it's going to favor one side or the other. Or we're going to have to have Rapid and Blitz, which is also pos posing the question of whether it became a real uh, classical uh, world championship for some. Uh, so it's, there's no an ideal solution. Talking about draws, Nigel, I know you have some views yeah. about stalemates, don't you? I, I, I want to... Before no. Nigel goes on, Kenny actually has something to say to Alejandro on that. Yeah. Let's just get his thoughts and then we'll get back to Nigel. Of course, sorry. Yeah, just sure. a moment. So, yeah, I was thinking that, okay, um, I, I didn't consider uh, the world champion has uh, an advantage over the challenger because we have to remember that the challenger has more motivation, you know, to prove to be the next world chess champion. So, I mean, it's, you know, you have to dethrone the world champion. So I don't see how the world champion has an advantage if the match ends in a, in a tie, you know. Wait, let, let so me get because I, I believe that the world champion, he, he represents his generation. So, I mean, he's, 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 the, he's, the, he's the world champion. So to, to be world champion, you have to beat the world champion. Kenny, who would you like to see the next world champion? Who would you like to see? Oh, uh, Any favorites? I don't know. No, no. <laughs> Kenny, so I, 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 I used to like Aronian. I thought I think he, he has. Yeah, I mean, I. <laughs> you used to. Yeah, I, I, I was. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Aronian, actually. I'm a big fan of Aronian. And, uh, Is he in the audience? Uh, I don't see him. I see him. But okay. Uh, I hope he pulls through in the next candidates. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. Nigel, stalemate. Thank you, Kenny. No, no, stalemate. I, I just want to answer because actually Kenny uh, is raising a very serious point. I know you're living in Venice these days, Kenny, but I can assure you last time I was in Cape Town, there were no lions on, on the streets there. Mm. But, but the serious point uh, is um, that... Uh, there is actually a strong argument for what Kenny says. Um, the, the most, uh, I think, disastrous match um, you know, in chess history was the Karpov-Kasparov match in, in 1984 to 1985, which lasted for five months. I mean, I recall this match. Uh, it was incredibly boring. I mean, it was, I mean, you had months and months and months of utter tedium. Hmm. And the problem, when you have um, a situation where it's the first to win a certain number of games, is that the players, they are, they are psychologically satisfied with the draw. And what you are proposing, which is the old way of doing things, you give the draw odds to the champion, it means that at any point somebody is ahead or somebody is winning the match. Yeah. And this causes the imbalance. So the, the problem with the, the system is you have to have a match which is long enough because obviously uh, if the two of us play a one-game match and I'm the defending champion, I have a colossal advantage. But if we play a long enough match, that advantage uh, diminishes. And so um, the, the problem was now in, in London, they have a very short match. Twelve games is historically a very short match. The shortest matches have been ten-game matches. 
in World Championship history. So this is right on the, the end of the spectrum where it's a very short match. So you have to ex uh, extend it. And it can be done if you just cut out a lot of these rest days. So um, I, I'm not opposed to uh, your idea. It's, it's, uh, it, uh, I'm not sure I'm in favor of it, but I'm not opposed to it either. Uh, Sandy, it, we have a question, sorry, Nigel, from the audience. I think from yeah. Brian. Brian has a question. Yes. I'm not really a supporter of Blitz or uh, the Rapid. other game, but I'm very much a, a classicist in the sense that I support strongly the classical game. But I do wonder whether you need more than four hours to complete a game. And therefore, the time controls and things which seem to be inevitable. I mean, I just wonder whether to play a classical game of chess you need more than four hours. Now, technically, I can't answer that. I haven't got any thoughts about the technical. Are you, are you, are you asking whether you should shorten the time control for I am, next year? Exactly. Yeah, yes, you should. That's the That's answer. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But I mean, I, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. have no idea. Yeah, no, no. I, I think involved. it's um, uh, the, the trend in chess, Brian, over uh, the centuries is actually ever faster time controls. But... You, no, no, no I'm, well, I'm, I'm all in favor of classical chess. I mean, classical ch chess should not be abolished. But you can go for the, the regular time control, which you have at the Olympiads. Uh, you know, you play this 40-move um, time control like you have here, and then you get 30 minutes after this. So you're reducing the time and incidentally, you can get your reports into the newspapers the, uh, the, uh, yeah, on the same day. So you've got that advantage, and we can have uh, dinner a little bit earlier. I so, think maybe so it's next year. Next year, it's it's a done sure. deal. It's a done deal. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have another question Sonia? from Mr. Bilava. Yes, Elisba. Welcome to Gibraltar, my friends. Nice to have you here with us. Uh, my question is uh, if best Bobby Fischer can beat today's Magnus? If Bobby Fischer at his best could beat today's Magnus Carlsen, who's just had a fantastic result once again at Vicenza. Alejandro? No. No? <laughs> Fiona? I would also tend to say no. Irene? I think if he was equipped with the current technology, I mean with the proper preparation like what Magnus had with the well, computer and engine, I think he would be able to. All right. So you're, so you're asking whether Bobby Fischer at his best could beat a guy who just recently has drawn 21 classical games in a <laughs> row. Yes. <laughs> it's possible. Mm. Uh, it's possible. I don't say he would, but mm. it's certainly possible. <laughs> You know, I, I have the utmost respect for Magnus. He's an absolutely brilliant player, but um, uh, and he's on his way to becoming the greatest of all time. Um, but uh, I think you you, you need a, a longer sort of track record to mm. to demonstrate that. And uh, you know what I always say about Bobby Fischer was that Bobby Fischer. At his best, he burned brighter than any other player in, in, in chess history. So, um, you know, uh, it was very, very intense. I'd like to come back to the time control there question. I'd like to ask Irene here Stuart, how you feel about playing Stuart, a longer... I'm sorry. But sorry. I think, uh, Simply I wanted to say that uh, Bobby, was, uh, Bobby was in middle game, I think, better than whoever. And also his technique was much better than whoever's uh, technique. So why not to, why we think that he, he wasn't able to beat Magnus? Magnus is a great, of course, but where Magnus can uh, show uh, to Fischer that he's better? Where? In openings, in middle game, or in technique? We have so one of Magnus's best friends here in the front row. Maybe, Tanya, you could give the... Yeah. 
Well, he's probably the best endgame player in the history of chess. So, uh, Magnus. Yeah, I think that's that's fairly obvious. Yeah. When when I spoke to uh, uh, Boris Spassky about um, the strengths of Bobby Fischer, uh, Boris always said that um, uh, Bobby was much better than him in the openings, and he said he was much better than Spassky in the end game as well. He, Fisher was a tremendous end game player, and uh, Boris felt that his only chance was in the the hurly burly of the the right. middle game. That on the the technical aspects he couldn't compete. I'd, I'd also like to bring in Fiona now because you come from a very small chess nation, uh, Luxembourg. Tell us a little bit about funding on the your your. your I mean, how, how does it work in Luxembourg? What's, what's been your experience of... The truth is uh, I, I know very little uh, of this subject. I know there is some funding, but uh, not so much. I mean, we get our expenses covered for the Olympiads. But the problem, of course, in Luxembourg is there is not a single professional chess player. So there isn't... Um, I think we're also a long way to go, but at least chess is recognized as a sport. Mm -hmm. And America chess is booming, or is that not the right word? How would you describe the, the growth of chess in the States? The I, I would say it's pretty exponential. I yeah, mean, really? In the past 10 years, it's not about the fact that the federation or the government gives money the way that it works in so many other countries, but there's opportunities. Opportunities to find work in chess, to play tournaments that are well paid. Uh, so nobody's going to be giving you money uh, mm -hmm. the way that it works in some countries but you have the tournaments to play and make money. You have more round-robin events. You have more opens with big prices. Uh, I think that it's a very different scenario compared to other countries, but it's definitely opened the doors for a lot of people that uh, wouldn't have been able to play chess. I believe that Alexander Anistruk said it best when he got second uh, not two years ago in the US Championship, mm -hmm. that he was basically thinking of quitting. Really? And uh, not playing the US Championship anymore until the St. Louis Chess Club came around because the price fund was significantly increased and just the fact that we have the ability to make money in America from playing has given the opportunity to a lot of these juniors to keep playing chess and becoming much, much stronger uh, than they would have had without these opportunities. What about sponsorship in, in the States? In, I mean, apart from St. Louis, of course, where you've got all these wonderful events and opportunities thanks to one man, basically, and then his vision, if you like, for chess. What about in other parts of the States? I believe that some people have private sponsors, even if it's small. Uh, I don't think it's very often or very common, but... It's a, it's a tough life. Well. Chess is a tough living. It's a tough way to make a living. It's a tough living, but, for example, I believe that... Um, well, Hikaru has Red Bull, for example, and one of the players here, Varujan Akobian, you can see him with his jacket, Improve My Chess. Mm -hmm. It's actually a venture by Meskin Amanov, in, uh, who's also a grandmaster in Chicago. And they make good money. They are selling uh, chess lessons, they sell chess content, and there's a good market of people that buy it. And they're able, as a chess company, to sponsor chess players. Right. Interesting, yeah. Tanya? I have a question for you. Um, so I want you to put this controversy to rest once and for all. At the World Championship, there was a video that leaked from your team. Uh, leaked or it came out by mistake. It, it had some variations on it, and everybody was wondering if this was something that you did on purpose or it was a genuine mistake. <laughs> Tell us, for once and for all, what really happened? <laughs> You're on the spot, Alejandro. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I'm under contractual obligation <laughs> to not answer the question, so I'm going to have to leave it at that. Yeah, it, was, it was obviously an error. <laughs> Give us a little bit. Uh, well, there was one variation that was shown in the video that was played in the World Championship, so yeah. you can probably draw some conclusions from that. Yeah. It was an error. <laughs> <laughs> one big mistake. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. All right, do we have any more questions from the audience? Yes, we do. We have. Good, good. Hello, it's uh, Andy Smith again. Just a very quick question. I, I, I took up uh, chess uh, during the Bobby Fischer Spassky match, and I remember the drama of that when it was the, f the first item on the BBC News was the Fischer Spassky match ahead of all the politics. And uh, it was 24 games, and I think 12 games is way, way too short for a, 
a dramatic world championship match. It should be back to 24. But the question I was going to ask was, in terms of charisma, do you think uh, Magnus Coulson has the same charisma as, in chess terms as Mikhail Tal or Alekin or Bobby Fischer? He's fairly... Uh, his chess doesn't catch the imagination that those players did in the past. Charisma is your middle name, I believe, Irene, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. How did you get that name? Is I it because know. of your career? I mean, how? You know? I'll ask my parents. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. No, I don't know. Yeah. Magnus Carlsen, he's charismatic. Who thinks he's charismatic? Eh, why not? I, I, yeah. I think he is, yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually like his press conferences. He's yeah. always saying something yeah. quite interesting. And, okay, what you like in chess uh, varies from people to people, and it's, it's impossible to ask people to play the same way that great old players play. The chess has become so much more sophisticated, especially since you know, the Fischer era. You can't ask Magnus to play you know, the way that Bobby Fischer played. It's just hmm. we've built on him so much. He's playing against such stronger opposition. Yeah, perhaps sometimes you would like for him to sacrifice all his pieces like Tal did. But I remember so many times that I've seen Magnus Carlsen play a combination or find an endgame variation that just amazed me. And it was, it was fantastic. And seeing it as a commentator sometimes where, you know, we have all the engines and everything's running and it's still seeing him find something that even the engine didn't find in an endgame that you would think was so simple. Right. I remember mm -hmm. one time that he dominated Hikaru's Knights uh, with a lone bishop in a long Slav game, I think in one of the London chess classes. And for me, it was basically like solving a study, except he did it over the board. So perhaps Magnus is not your cup of tea, but for me, Magnus is an absolutely fantastic player that really brings joy to the game. Yeah, absolutely. I think we'd all agree with that. Just uh, by the way, on the subject of uh, great, great players, why is Emmanuel Lasker mentioned so rarely? How old is, how old is Magnus? 28. 28, is it? Yeah, well, you see, Emmanuel Lasker was world champion for 27 years. So you can only beat the people who are there in front of you. You can't beat the people that are not there. And uh, I think that is, uh, you know, obviously it's a remarkable achievement and not one which will be equaled or, or surpassed. So... Um, you know, I think he's worth a mention. Is he your favorite player of the past, Nigel? He isn't my favorite player of the past, but I've grown to appreciate him o over the, the years. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I liked Capablanca, I liked Aliekin, I liked guys, guys like this. Um, Irina, your favorite player of the past or favorite players? Do you have favorites, just to sort of wrap up, your favorite players, Ch chess history? Do you ever um, read old Tormund books, look at old games? I would say Capablanca. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I just like, um, I just like his style of play, like very, I don't know, and also he's handsome. So. And he's handsome. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're getting down to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fiona. I only ever had one chess idol. It was Alexander Morozovich. <laughs> really. Yep. Okay. <laughs> 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 We wrap it up here, or what? <laughs> Alejandro. And what about just just before we sort of wrap up? Say, Costa Rica. You born and bred there. Tell us a little bit about Costa Rica, about growing up as a as a learning chess there, right? Uh, well, Costa Rica is a beautiful country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, no, chess is really non-existent in Costa Rica, and I think it was one of the great difficulties I had uh, coming up as a chess player. And I'm very much what they call the ICC generation because back then ICC was like the main way of playing chess. That's how yeah. you met people, and thanks to it, I was able to practice against strong players. But, I mean, neither in the past nor right now has there been any real support uh, for a player of that caliber. And right. for me, it was very obvious that at some point I had to move away. Uh, I ended up choosing going to university instead of continuing in a traditional chess career. But in either case, I just don't see how I would have stayed in a country that is so far away from the centers of chess. Right, right, right. Also, I was going to say about time, uh, the time controls, Nigel. There was, I was watching yesterday, I think it was, um, I came upstairs to fetch something, and there was a game still going on. It was between uh, Stavrula Tzolakidu from Greece 
and uh, Alexandra Goretzkina, and they were still playing after seven hours, 25 minutes, um, two of our women players, and it was finally a draw. So, Brian, that comes back to your point. But other, uh, some players have said to me that, hey, it's actually nice to come and play a long classical time control here in Gibraltar and, and to be able to play out endings uh, as we used to in the old days. Um, and it's not necessarily a negative after, thing. After adjournments. After adjournments. <laughs> it's not all negative. I mean, some people do like to, to have time. And, you know, you go upstairs after five hours and see plenty of exciting games still in place. And uh, the results still in the balance, you know. So it's not just a negative thing having long no. time controls. Yeah. Okay. Nigel? Yeah, I no. think maybe we're about time to, to finish. Unless you've got a last question from the audience. Um, anyone? I think not. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the audience for, for staying with us. I'd like to thank all our panelists, including Maxime, who is here, first of all. Maxime vachet Grav, first of all. He's still here. Alejandra Ramirez. Fiona. Irene. Irene, it's sorry. Irene, not Irene. Irene, Irene. <laughs> and Nigel Short. Thank you. And me, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you.